Okay, I think we're ready to start the next session. Uh, this session uh, has as a common denominator the 1990s. Uh, we have uh, th three speakers and one chair. The, uh, the session is, starts with Eduardo Miranda, um, then moves to Indra Neil Paul, who were PhD students in the 90s, spanning the start to the end, and then uh, at Rutgers, and uh, Jimmy Alsi and myself, postdocs at Rutgers in the 90s as well. So, uh, our first talk this um, in this session will be given by Eduardo Miranda from Campinas. Uh, he will tell us about emergent symmetry and transport in disordered chains. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Andy, and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for this invitation to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here at this occasion. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, emergent symmetry in disordered chains, uh, and if there is time at the end, maybe I'll talk a little bit about transport too. And of course, I'm, I'm going to start uh, with a few words about peers. So unfortunately, I couldn't find pictures uh, that I had, that I own uh, with peers from that time because they are all, these are all printed photos and uh, they're stuffed in boxes in my house and I'm very disorganized, I couldn't find them. But fortunately, uh, Ide Takagi uh, was very uh, nice and he sent me this photo from 2002 uh, in Brasilia where we, uh, I organized this conference. So we have many usual suspects here, Gabe Apley, Vlad Obrasavljevic, Piers, myself, and Hide. Okay, so this is the only photo uh, from around that time that I could find. Uh, so, however, in the absence of pictures, uh, I decided to, since I'm probably the first student to talk, uh, of course, we heard Rebecca speaking before, but today I'm the first student, and I'm, I think, one of the earliest students of Piers. So I, I decided to tell an anecdote that I think shows a little bit about Pierce's uh, personality and character. And uh, so the thing is that uh, <clears throat> just before the PhD defense, Pierce would warn us students that he would ask a question, a general question, not completely unrelated to our work, okay? Completely unrelated to what we were doing. And it could be anything. And so I was, of course, very nervous about this. I didn't know what was coming. And in my case, I don't know if he, if, if he kept this tradition after me. <laughs> and I don't know if he remembers it, what happened in my case. But in my case, he asked me about this, the potato cock. <laughs> so this is a toy uh, of his children. And he brought the potato cock. He put it there. And he asked me to explain how it works. <laughs> And of course, the potato clock is just a battery. Uh, and I had no idea about the uh, chemical elements inside the, the, the potato that made this run. So I, you know, I gave him an answer. I can't remember what, what the answer I gave him. And, uh, and I can't remember what his act, reaction was, but I think it was something like this. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, so the work I'm going to talk about is work I, uh, I have been doing with some students and co a collaborator. So this is Victor Quito, he's, he's the main uh, name be behind this work, and also la later work with Luis Faria, Pedro Lopez, and a collaborator, uh, José Hoyos from, from Sao Paulo. So I'm going to talk about disordered chains. So disorder is a topic that has not been mentioned too much in, the, in this conference, so I'm going to take a different axis here and, uh, and talk about these disordered spin chains. And uh, the motivation is there are a few, not many, but there are a few uh, quasi 1D compounds that realize these disordered spin chains. So here are some examples. Some of them are, are most of them are, I would say, are spin a half systems. There is, however, one which is spin one. And of course, these are quasi one dimensional systems. And uh, 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 the, uh, the particular feature of these systems is that, for instance, this, they don't seem to order to very low temperatures. Uh, so this is just the susceptibility of this system. And, uh, and the theory I'm going to talk about uh, is the theory that gives this uh, uh, dashed line 
prediction for the susceptibility. And, uh, and I'll try to explain to you how this result is obtained. Um, so, uh, okay. Uh, there, there are some also some interest in this, in this in this type of system because of cold atom systems that can be um, engineered to be one dimensional and in, in in many cases you can introduce disorder by hand with speckle disorder of laser and this there's also some interest in that direction so <clears throat> What I'm going to describe now is the method that's used to analyze these systems. This is a very powerful method geared to uh, describe disordered systems, especially strongly disordered systems. So of course, you probably know that disorder is a very difficult uh, uh, aspect of condensed matter to, to deal with. And the advantage of the method that I'm going to talk about is that it gives you very reliable answers uh, in certain cases. Uh, uh, regarding disordered systems. So let's take, for, as a first example, uh, a disordered uh, one-dimensional Heisenberg chain, uh, spin a half, and so you have these coupling constants which are random variables, and I'm going to assume that these random variables are independent, independently chosen from a certain distribution, Pj. Uh, this distribution has only positive values, so just anti-ferromagnetic couplings, and uh, I'll assume it has a sharp cutoff omega at high energies. So <clears throat> the idea of the method is the following, it was uh, proposed by these people, is the following. Okay, since this is a disordered system, uh, what you do is the following. So it's a decimation procedure. You take the, high, the largest coupling constant in the chain, which I call omega here, because it should be close to the cutoff, <clears throat> and you, if you look at the uh, level structure for these two spins, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a ground singlet and an excited triplet separated by this very large ener energy scale omega. So the idea is the following. Just uh, ignore that high energy triplet. At low energy, it, it's probably not go going to be very important. And, uh, and besides, you uh, now calculate with perturbation theory what the uh, polarization of this middle singlet here does to the interaction between the neighboring spins, S1 and S4. So if you just do second order perturbation theory, you can show that uh, uh, the polarization of this guy, which has been removed because it's just a singlet, uh, introduces a direct uh, exchange coupling between S1 and S4 that was not there before. And the coupling is given by this expression. It you know, looks like very much like uh, second order perturbation theory expression. And the new coupling, J tilde, uh, you should see, you should note, it's smaller than both J1 and J2. Okay? So uh, the tendency is, to, uh, is, is for smaller couplings to be generated by this, generation, generate, uh, uh, this decimation procedure. So the net result is that S2 and S3 disappear, they form a singlet, and a new coupling appears between S1 and S4, okay? So you just iterate this uh, procedure, and <clears throat> what the work of these people uh, showed was that um, the, the flow of this decimation procedure leads to universal distributions at low energies, okay? So this is an a real, uh, uh, flow uh, of, of, a, of a speed a half system. So as you can see from the picture, because you generate these very low energy uh, scale uh, couplings, the distribution becomes extremely singular at low J. <clears throat> Even if you start with a uniform distribution, uh, it becomes very singular as you iterate. So in fact, you can show that they are all attracted by this fixed point distribution, which is just a power law, okay? Very singular power law. And actually, the exponent alpha here is going to zero very slowly with the log of the, of the energy scale. And, uh, and so this power law is becoming ever more singular as you iterate. Now, the interesting thing <coughs> about this fixed point distribution is that if you calculate the width of the distribution compared to the mean, it diverges. Okay, so, so the interpretation of this is that the effective disorder at low energies becomes increasingly larger and larger and, and, and actually it becomes infinite uh, at zero temperature as you approach zero temperature or zero energy. Okay, now you remember that the procedure consists of doing perturbation theory, uh, assuming that the central 
uh, coupling is large. And because the distribution gets larger and larger, broader and broader, the, uh, the error you make by doing a second order perturbation theory becomes smaller and smaller. So in fact, the method is asymptotically exact. Okay, so you can actually get exact results. Of course, at the beginning, you're making mistakes. So as long as the flow at the beginning uh, is not terribly badly behaved, you should trust your results at the end. Or another way of putting it, if you start with very strong disorder, uh, the disorder gets even bigger and your results are probably reliable. So uh, pictorially, what you do is the following, you find the strongest cup cup coupling, you decimate it, you renormalize the adjacent spins, you do this progressively, you do this, you do that, and eventually you start decimating longer couplings, okay? So when you do that, you generate new couplings like this, and eventually you have a larger coupling, and as you do that forever, you generate ever larger couplings and larger uh, bonds between these, these uh, spins. So the ground state that you get has this structure, which sometimes called random singlet phase, very often called the random singlet phase. It's, it's a sort of a valence bond glass, okay? So it's a sort of the glassy version of the valence bond solid. And the, the feature to remember here is that you have well-separated spins of all sizes, uh, uh, spin pairs of all sizes, connected by these uh, uh, large bonds. Now, what about excitations above this ground state? So the, the excitations are just the breaking of these bonds. So when you break a bond, you get a triplet excitation, a localized triplet excitation. Now, of course, uh, you can also show, um, I don't have time to do it here, but it's not too hard to show that the energies of these longer bonds, they, they are smaller and smaller because they are longer, they, are, they happen later at the procedure, and they actually uh, depend on the size through this sort of stretched exponential behavior with this characteristic uh, 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 exponent psi. So this is called activated dynamical scaling as opposed to the usual dynamical scaling of, uh, of critical points, okay? Where this is, this is usually a power law. Uh, now this can, uh, if you analyze this, you can understand how um, low temperature properties uh, are, 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 are obtained. So for instance, at finite t, all the bonds which are longer than a certain L0, a certain length, which is obtained just by um, inverting this expression, putting E equal to T and inverting this, so LT is given here. So all the bonds that are longer than this length scale are broken, okay? And uh, so for instance, at temperature T, uh, they are going to be on the average separated by uh, a distance one over LT, which is given by this. So for instance, if you now look at the susceptibility of the system, you can, with extremely good accuracy at low energies, say that the susceptibility, uh, the contribution to the susceptibility from the singlets is zero, and the contribution from the spin, free spins is just Curie-like. So in the end, the susceptibility that you get is a Curie uh, 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 expression with a log correction. Okay, so, so because the distribution, once again, the distribution is broader and broader at lower energies, this is better and better approximated uh, by this expression, okay? The, in this sense, it's, it's asymptotically exact. So the expression I showed, that was shown at the beginning compared to the experimental data is this, this expression for the susceptibility. You can get other physical properties using similar arguments, but I'm going to just show this uh, susceptibility argument. So what I want you to keep in mind is that the, um, at finite temperatures, uh, the state of the system can be viewed as a collection of random singlets, a valence bond glass, and free spins, okay? So uh, what our work consisted of was uh, to look at the spin one system. A spin one version of the Heisenberg model has been studied extensively. Uh, uh, for the, in the Heisenberg limit, but of course every spin one uh, system can have also a biquadratic uh, term like this. It's absent in spin a half, but it's in spin one, it's in principle there. And our goal is to understand uh, sort of the phase diagram of this system. So uh, it's convenient when you're discussing the system to talk, instead of using these J and D variables, to put them in a 2D plot, 
and define radial variables and angular variables, which I call E and theta here. And I'm going to be looking at, uh, at the case where the, theta, the initial distribution is such that the theta is constant and the E's are disordered. Okay? You can also analyze the case where theta is distributed, but I'm going to focus here because uh, on, the, on this initial case where the theta is fixed. It's easier to understand the phase diagram in this case. So once again, you can do the same thing that I showed before. You can try to decimate this, the system, but now the, the, the interactions are different. And when, in the spin one case, the difference is that you have three possible level structures. So the ground state might be a singlet, a triplet, or a quintuplet, and the excited states also could, could be different. So the procedure consists of decimating these higher energy guys and looking at the effective Hamiltonian generated within the low, low energy multiplet, which now can be a singlet, but can also be a spin one or a spin two. Okay, so uh, to understand when you have this case, that case, or that case, it's useful to look at this 2D plot, and um, the answer is the following. In this region here, you always have this situation here. So when J and D fall in this region, you always form a singlet. In this region here, you can form a, you, you form a spin one, and this, in this other region here, you can form a spin two, you form a spin two. Now, uh, in my talk, I'm not gonna talk about this region here. This region, it generates large spins, the physics is dominated by very large spins and the flow is completely different from the one that I'm going to talk about here. So I'm going to talk about just this uh, portion of the, of the phase diagram where you can either have that decimation or that one over there, okay? Now, uh, once again, the analysis is, I, I can give you details of the analysis but I don't have much time to do it here so I'm going to give you just the, uh, the answer and I'll try to uh, explain why this happens. So it's not too surprising to say that in this whole region here, you get a phase which is very much like the phase that I explained before for the spin a half case, okay? Because you only form singlets, okay? So this is not too different from the Heisenberg case. Actually, the Heisenberg point is embedded there. And once again, you have at finite t a collection of random singlets and free spins. Okay, so this is not very different from what I talked before. Activated dynamical scaling, psi is equal to one half. The susceptibility is given by that expression, okay? There's a small detail here, which is that this phase ends at pi over four, and here, this goes to a smaller angle. So actually, uh, the, the random singlet phase extends a little bit more there, but these are details that I'm not gonna go into. Now, the interesting phase we found is actually the one that lives in this wedge, which I called one over there. Remember, that is the edge where you can form spin ones when you decimate. So, uh, so the nice thing about this case is that, as I said, you can decimate these two, guys, two spin ones and get another spin one, and this spin one can then decimate another spin one and, and generate a singlet. So this is a process by which you can form singlets out of three spins. Okay, so the picture of the ground state, it's still a random singlet phase, but it's a random singlet trio phase, okay? Actually, you can also form sextet, in other words, singlets made out of six or nine, any multiple of three, but they're less frequent than the trios. So I'm going to just talk about the trios here, okay? So this is the tr structure now of the ground state. Now, you can also work out uh, the energy length scale relationship in this case, the exponent is different, it's one third, okay? And anybody that guessed that this three here has to do with the number of spins in the trio is right, okay? So this is three. Uh, and, uh, but however, the, the, it's still a phase that's characterized by infinite disorder. You can still make uh, uh, exact claims at low energies. And in, in particular, you can also have this uh, type of susceptibility and other, other properties like that. Okay, so now the building blocks, if, you, if I want to look at finite temperature, the building blocks are singlet trios and, and free spins, okay? Now, uh, I want to talk about emergent SU2 three, SU3 three symmetry in this system. Remember, this is an SU2 symmetric chain, okay? Just spins with uh, scalar interactions. So what about SU3, okay? Uh, so uh, 
the SU3 comes in in the following way. We all know that the spin one operators form a three-dimensional represent representation of SU2. However, if you add to the usual spin operators these so-called quadrupolar moments, bilinear operators in the, in the spin operators, these eight guys here, they actually form a, 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 a they, they, they form a, a set of generators of the group SU3, okay? So actually, if you put these guys in an exponential with arbitrary uh, 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 constants, this is a general representation for the fundamental, actually for the fundamental representation of SU3, okay? Uh, SU3 is different from SU2 in the sense that there is also another one, another uh, three-dimensional representation different from the other one, which is a so-called anti-fundamental representation, uh, which is obtained if you just flip the signs of these five guys here, the five quadrupolar operators, uh, become, uh, together with the usual spin operators, become, uh, become generators uh, of SU3. Okay, so, uh, so if you, now you can actually rewrite the Hamiltonian, which had only linear and bilinear spin operators, in terms of these generators. It has this form that's given here. It's easy to show. And it's, it's interesting that, for instance, in these two cases here, pi over 4 and minus pi over 2, these are special points where this Hamiltonian is such that this um, uh, coefficient here equals that coefficient, uh, and, or, or at least in, in, in either they are the same or they have, uh, they have the same modules and different signs. And in that case, this, this Hamiltonian has exact SU3, SU3 symmetry. This is well known for the clean case, for the, the pi over 4 point is actually a, an integrable point, very well understood. The minus pi over 2 is also SU3 symmetric. And uh, so uh, we actually solved the disordered case a few years back uh, for, uh, in, in the context of general disordered SUN chains. And there's a hat tip to peers here who, uh, uh, I guess the, the, the apple never falls very far from the tree. So I, 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 uh, this is one of Peer's obsessions, you know, SUN group, large N expansion. So we decided to, to look at this disordered SUN chain, uh, in particular to look if, to, to check, since we get, can get exact results, we wanted to check whether the SUN uh, chain, the, the N equals infinity limit is characteristic of finite N chains. And the answer is no, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to discuss this here. Uh, so, so, so these points are special, but what I'm saying to you now is that the whole phase, one or two, actually have emergent SU3 symmetry. Remember that the Hamiltonians in this uh, region here are not SU3 symmetric, okay? But at low energies, uh, SU3 emerges as, 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 a, as, a, as a symmetry. So the reasoning very quickly is the following. Uh, so these singlets here, which we all agree are SU2 singlets, once you put back all these SU3 generators, these are also SU3 singlets, okay? In other words, in uh, technical terms, the eight SU3 generators, they annihilate this this state of three or two spins. So these are both SU2 and SU3 singlets. So they, are, they, they um, both uh, uh, transform at, as the trivial representation of SU3. Um, and, uh, and, and you can actually look at this pair uh, in terms of an, a quark or a fundamental and an anti-quark representation of SU3. So this is like a meson if you want to look, if you want to use high energy language. Whereas the trios are like baryons, they are bound states of three quarks, okay? This is exactly the same kind of thing that happens in, in hadrons, hadron physics. And of course the uh, free spins also uh, 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 transform as SU3 uh, uh, objects. So they also can be viewed both as SU2 and as SU3 objects. So since the building blocks of the, of the system are the singlets and the free spins, and, these, and both of these transform as SU3, you should expect an emergent SU3 symmetry at, symmetry at low energies. And this is actually what, what happened. Okay, okay, so, so we call this kind of phase uh, where you have pairs, a mesonic phase, and this 
trio phase, a baryonic phase because of this uh, high energy uh, analogy. So for instance, if you, if you now couple uh, uh, an external field to all the eight generators and you calculate the susceptibility, the response of the system to this uh, external magnetic field that's coupled to both uh, dipolar and quadrupolar operators, they're all the same. They all behave with the same exponent. Okay, so this is what we call an emergent SU3 for, for, for this system. The same thing happens, for instance, for the uh, correlation function, which I'm not going to show here, but uh, uh, th this is the sense in which we, we talk about an emergent SU3 okay, in this system. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I, th I guess I'm not going to be able to talk about transport, but uh, what we, afterwards when we, we saw this was, uh, well, just look, let, let's just look at higher spins, and there, we're probably going to find other cases of emergent symmetries at higher spins. And this can be done. It's, uh, it's a long analysis, but it's not too hard. Unfortunately, we do not find any other examples of these emergent symmetries at higher spins. Okay? So we only get conventional psi equals one half uh, uh, phases. They actually have SU 2s plus 1 symmetry, but they are conventional spin pair phases. We wanted to, to get these trios and quintuplets and so on. Uh, uh, there are phases where psi is equal to one third, but it has absolutely no emergent symmetry. So we were not very happy with this, and um, that's what, where things stood at this point. But then the, uh, Victor said, well, there's another way of looking at this system, which is the following. SU, SU, uh, spin one is also the fundamental representation of SO3, right? Usual rotations in three dimensions, okay? So maybe the way to go is not SU2 with spin 1 to SU2 with, spin, with larger spins, but rather SO3 to SON. Okay? And, and this is actually the case. So if you write an SON symmetric Hamiltonian, but with uh, different coupling constants in these two sectors, so this has SON symmetry, but no SUN symmetry because, uh, but however, if this guy is equal to that guy, it would have SUN symmetry. So the same thing happens here. So when this guy is equal to that, you have explicit SUN symmetry, but when you do the disordered, so this can be viewed as a sort of an isotropic SUN model, but in the disordered case, when you flow through the same mechanism that happened in the spin one case, you also have phases where you have emergent SUN symmetry, emergent SUN baryons, emergent SUN mesons, and the baryons, you know, they form this, uh, objects where the number of spins in the singlet is given by n. So it could be, for instance, n equal to five. Five, for instance, in the case of SO5. Now, you may be asking yourselves, well, what, what is this good for? But SON, what does, it, what does it mean? Okay, but it turns out the following. Well, first of all, SO2 going to SU2, em, SU2 emerging out of SO2 is actually very old. It's just the XXE chain that was analyzed uh, uh, early on by Fisher, because you know XXZ has SO2 symmetry, and actually Fisher showed that the correlation functions in the X direction and the Z direction are all the same exponent. Uh, SO3 going to SU3 is what we had seen before. And SO4, for instance, we know that SO4 is isomorphic to SU2 cross SU2, and this is just this Kugel-Komsky model. So if you take the Kugel-Komsky model, where you have spin and orbital operators, the Kugel-Komsky model, it is a realization of, a, of an SO4 Hamiltonian. When you do the disorder version, you have a, an emergent SU4 out of this problem. SO4 is, SO5, I'm sorry, is isomorphic to SP4, symplectic group four, but there, we didn't find anything interesting there. But SO6 is isomorphic to SU4. So it could have SU6 coming out of SU4, and it turns out that with cold atoms, it is possible to build uh, systems. In principle, nobody has ever done this, but in principle, it's possible to generate an SU4 chain, and if it's disorder, you might see SU6 uh, uh, emergent symmetry coming out of that. So I guess I'm not going to talk about transport, so let me just skip to the conclusions. Uh, so. Uh, what I just talked to you about is just emergent uh, symmetry in very strongly disordered symmetries, which are generally in this scheme SON to SUN. So 
I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo.